Did they do a fusion? They didn't do that, but they got kind of good. Yeah. still pretty intense. And um, they covered it. They wanted to put me in the hospital for a day. And I said, I'm outpatient. Right. I'm outpatient. I'm leaving. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bring the saws to your house. Yeah, my wife said, kill me. But, um, but there was, and Glenwood had done one on the monument project that we're still working on. In fact, we're still needed. Well, I can tell you the person to contact directly, and I, I you know, I can kind of say gut feeling now is probably a better time than it would have been a year or two ago. Uh, not that I'm giving insider information, but uh, we do have a little bit of surplus money dropping around in the philanthropy fund. So, yeah, give me, give me your. You want me to text you the contact information? You want an email? I, I do. Email. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> All right. Hang on. J -J -J -E we have eight people tuning in so far. Are they are we live now? Jeb Stewart, 100, Earthlink. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jeb Stewart, 100 Earthlink. Okay. okay. We're live. Clock isn't right here. This one is it ahead? Uh, no, behind. it's two or three behind. minutes behind. Okay. At least two. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I'm going to lower my mask. Uh, thank you all for participating. Some of you here at the Historic Harrisburg Resource Center and some of you watching remotely, either by Facebook or on the Historic Harrisburg website on our education page. And uh, we hope that, the, that our technology uh, uh, works effectively for you for tonight's program. I'm David Morrison. I'm the Executive Director of Historic Harrisburg, and this is one of our series of fourth Monday educational programs. They're free to the public, and uh, we've resumed them now that we have the te technology to uh, present them to you, and people who are sitting here are, are social distancing. The chairs have been spread out with a re reduction in uh, the number of people we can accommodate, and we'll continue to do it on that basis. Uh, until the, the regulations uh, are eased. I want to mention a few other upcoming activities. This coming Saturday, October 31st from 10 o'clock to noon, we have a walking tour of the Harrisburg State Hospital campus. That's the oldest uh, state-run mental hospital uh, in the United States. There are older private hospitals 
but uh, that closed about 10 years ago. It's got some beautiful old historic buildings, and it's got some very interesting stories. And Fuller Runyon, who is the manager of the property, works for the Department of General Services, will be our interior tour guide, and a couple of historic Harrisburg volunteers will handle the outdoor portion of the tour. So if you haven't signed up already, go to historicharrisburg.com or join on Facebook or call us at 717-233-4646 and we'll sign you up. Um, we have a, another tour coming up uh, two weeks later, Saturday, uh, uh, November 14th. We have a dog-friendly walking tour of the art, architecture, and history of Pennsylvania's Capitol Complex. You meet at the fountain behind the Capitol at 10 o'clock on Saturday, uh, November 14th. So some people have signed up already. There's still time to sign up. Uh, the prices are $15 uh, for non-members of Historic Harrisburg, $10 if you're a member, $5 if you're a student, and it's free if you're a dog. Okay, then our next Fourth Monday program, four weeks from tonight on Monday, November 23rd, uh, is called Heart of the City, the Harrisburg Fire Department's uh, look at the old Market Street and Market Square. So tonight we're visiting Market Square from the standpoint of its architectural history, and uh, next month it will be Dave Hausiel, who is the foremost fire historian in central Pennsylvania. He's written several books. Uh, he's a co-founder of the Pennsylvania National Fire Museum, uh, but he will be giving that program about some of the famous fires that raged in downtown Harrisburg uh, in, uh, in decades and centuries <coughs> past. Um, on Saturday, December 5th, we will be presenting our virtual Elegant Progressions. That's our famous progressive dinner, which has been going on for nearly 30 years. This year, it will be with, with take-home food that you can pick up here. Go to www.elegantprogressions.org for more information about that. We've got a calendar of, of upcoming events all the way through uh, the first half of 2021. Many of them will be remote like tonight's program and as the, re as the restrictions ease, we will be uh, uh, announcing more uh, activities in person. But the outdoor walking tours seem to work very well uh, even with pandemic restrictions and we've, we've had a lot of success with our walking tours over the last uh, couple of months uh, because of that. Uh, so we hope that that is keeping everybody attuned to the, our mission of historic preservation. Uh, and uh, if you're not a member, you should sign up so that you receive our, our uh, newsletter. That, there's one coming out in about two weeks and another one will come out before the end of the year. Uh, so please join Historic Harrisburg if you're not already a member. Tonight's program is called The Changing Skyline of Market Square, and our presenter uh, is Jeb Stewart. Jeb is a longtime member of Historic Harrisburg Association, former board member. He's our preservation advisor. Uh, he's done a lot of research on the history of Harrisburg, and particular downtown Harrisburg and Center City Harrisburg, where his career uh, was uh, involved him in creating the historic district of, uh, south of, of Market Street and restoring historic buildings uh, in the vicinity of Market Square. Very familiar with that. And this is going to be a wonderful presentation of some old photos, old maps, and so forth. We're also joined by Christopher Markley, who is vice president of Pennsylvania National Insurance Company, PNI. And uh, we're, we're going to be talking about their very spectacular project which went up on Market Square about 25 years ago in the mid-1990s, and how th that is how historic Harrisburg and PNI uh, kind of became friends and allies after initially sort of being adversaries over the issue of trying to preserve the, the old historic Senate Hotel. That kind of w was a difficult situation that had a happy ending, and we'll be talking about that later in our program. So without further ado, Jeb Stewart. some of the lights here so we can see a little bit better. Um, and thank you all for coming. Oh, that's a lot Maybe. of lights. <laughs> <laughs> there. there, that's pretty good, um, I think. Market Square is quite a study. Um, gone through two, three, four generations of development <laughs> since its 
laid out and founding in 1785, at the time uh, Harrisburg was founded, not incorporated as a borough, but founded, and when the town was laid out by William McClay and, um, and John uh, Harris. So the first slide we want to show is that section of the original plan from 1785, um, showing the square, as you can see here, and here are the lots that were laid out. Of course, these, these were large lots at the time, and over the years they were subdivided into smaller lots when buildings were developed, uh, consequently, consequently after the original layout of, of the borough. Uh, here we want to show uh, what Market Square looked like through this uh, rendering from 1858. So this would be considered Civil War Harrisburg. This is what downtown and, and the square looked like in 1858 is relatively accurate. Uh, the only building that we can identify that still exists uh, from this original um, overview is the um, Job Deposit Bank, now m and Bank, building over here, as you can see, which was built in 1839. We'll be talking more about that. But you can see that the markets uh, are in the square. And those markets were created in 1870. That's when the markets were first established in the square, which really established Harrisburg as a retail center. Retail from the standpoint of produce, farmers coming in, trade evolving from what was really a hamlet, if you want to call it before. Um, and the markets, of course, uh, evolved during that period or were established in 1807 and continued on. Um, here's a view uh, from 1880, um, looking at the markets. Uh, again, and they prevailed until 1889 when they were dismantled and um, removed. Uh, and look at the shots of the markets being uh, dismantled around that time. And it became as, as, as a borough and then the city, of course, which was established in 1860, um, became more uh, developed, more trafficked, uh, even though it was horses and wagons and so forth. Uh, the markets really became uh, a nuisance from the standpoint of, of being a thoroughfare, being the center of the town, and consequently they were uh, dismantled, and uh, the Chestnut Street market houses built in lieu of them on Chestnut Street, pretty much where the Benet Brick Apartment House now stands on Chestnut Street, which was a much better location at that time because it was not <laughs> in the center of town, in the center of the square, and a traffic uh, hazard, as it were. Moving on, we just wanted to show a couple of overview shots of the square before we get into the details. And the way this presentation is going to be organized is by looking at each one of the quadrants. The northwest quadrant, the northeast quadrant, the southeast quadrant, the southwest quadrant, so we can see the buildings that were there and how they evolved. But we wanted to show a couple of overview shots of the square um, before we get into that detail. This was taken around 1885, Market Street or Market Square was still not paved. Uh, you can see it's kind of dirt. Um, and uh, it wasn't paved really until the early 20th century, around 1904, 1905, during the City Beautiful movement. And that was when the city went ahead and passed a number of bond issues and other financings to improve the city. And this was under the tutelage of, of um, J. Harlis McFarland, Myra Lloyd Dock, and others to improve the city when it came to uh, public works projects, the expansion of the park system, and so forth. And at that time, street paving was a critical issue, and that uh, the, 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 the street in the square was paved shortly after this period. But we wanted to show it in its raw state from that standpoint. Jeff, would that have been macadam or cobblestones or brick or it what? Was, it was an early macadam, from what I understand. Yeah, an early macadam. Uh, there was a term for that, David, and I can't quite remember. And if anybody wants to chime in on any of this, and David, please do, obviously, for, and Christopher, likewise, and you guys in the audience, if there's anything I'm saying, or if there's anything where you can provide additional information, or if I'm saying anything that may be incorrect, feel free to, to chime in, if you will. Uh, but this is a cool shot because it shows the trolleys, it shows activity. Um, obviously, the markets are gone at this point. We will talk about the buildings when we get to them but we wanted to at least show a couple of overviews of the square and the activity and the hustle and bustle that occurred during that period. Moving on, that 
Madison Square in 1940. <laughs> Uh, obviously, uh, a long time after the earlier shot. Uh, but you can see, if I have one of these glasses over here somewhere, there we are. Um, automobile parking, trolley tracks. In fact, trolleys were uh, ended in Harrisburg in 1938 39, I believe, and buses took over at that point. So you can see a bus here, uh, which is very similar to where the bus transfer center is now on the uh, southeastern quadrant. Of Moving on, this is a kind of an interesting shot. This is a 1940s shot also, but one to include to see what they did at Christmas time, at least at that time, where a Christmas tree went up in the center of the square. Um, later, uh, when I recall this as a kid, there were four Christmas trees on the four corners. So I guess they abandoned the idea of having one major tree in the center of the square and went with four trees instead of that uh, at, uh, during that period. So now we want to look at the northwest quadrant of the square. Um, this shows what later became the Durban building, as well as the Yossi building, but this is an earlier structure that was there. Um, this later became the Goldsmiths building, which we'll talk about a little later. But we, this is an 1898 view. Um, it was a, an occasion, a procession that occurred at that time, but we just want to show what it looked like then. And if we jump ahead, well, not quite yet, we can see that the Senate Hotel uh, was built in 1906. So this is a circa 1914 shot. That corner building was still there then. Uh, later came down in 1920 for what was originally called the Yaffe Building, but later. Uh, labeled the Durban building, called the Durban building. Uh, Goldsmith is over here. Um, at the time, James Russ was the guy that built this. And he had a number of hotels in Harrisburg uh, in the early 20th century. And his plan was to expand the Senate Hotel, tear this down, expand it over to this point, and also tear down what was called the Greenwald building, just to the left of the Senate Hotel for, for an expansion. Um, that's why the word Senate is on here, because this corner property became an annex. It was originally a dry goods store um, before it was purchased by James Russ and became an annex, but his plan to expand the Senate obviously never occurred. It was a very ornate building. Um, Miller Cost was the architect who was a well-known architect in Harrisburg at the time. Beaux Arts in those arts in architectural design and trying to replicate that was exceedingly expensive. And there may have been other factors that prohibited uh, the expansion at, at that time. So moving ahead, we can see now pretty much the same corner around 1922. Uh, the Senate Hotel is there, obviously. The Greenwald Building still existed, wasn't demolished yet. And the Durban, um, uh, Yossi Durban building was built in 1922, where that annex was that we looked at, the two and a half story building was demolished for the, for the Durban building. And of course the Goldsmiths buildings and so forth, and we'll talk about this later. Jeb, can you reiterate what streets we're looking at, which yes, way the river sure. is, just we to get a Thank better... You for yeah. that. This is Market Street, looking west. Um, this is the second street in the square, looking north. This is what was originally the Union Trust building, which was later known as the U.S. L.E.D. building, uh, Goldsmiths and so forth. Um, what was originally the Blackstone building is here, which is now the Veterans Office building, which is part of uh, Dawson County Government's complex. Jeb, on the, the Green Wall or Green O Wall, how do you pronounce Green it? Wall. Green Wall. Greenwald, G-R-E-N-A-W-A-L-T. Three syllables, okay, yeah. so that appears to be uh, four windows wide, five stories high. Right. Uh, in your prior slide, it it looks bigger, but maybe it, maybe no, it wasn't that slide. Go back one more. Here it is. Here. Okay. Maybe and it's about one, two, three, four, five. Okay. And you can kind of half through the windows. All right. Okay. So it's the same building, and not only that, that building was listed on the map in the National Register of Historic Places. Um, Greenwald was a well-known can had a cannery business, and uh, the building was very old. It went back to the mid-19th century. And I suspect that, as you can see,
space is still there in that slide. Moving on, we just wanted to say 1959 glimpse of the, pretty much the same project. Again, showing the Union Trust building, later the U.S. F&G building, the Durban building, the Aussie building, Goldsmiths, and then what became the spot, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and this building, which is the Calder building. This is a close-up of Senate Hotel, uh, erected in 1906 by James Russ, who also had other hotels in the city. And um, you pretty much know what happened there. Um, and Mr. Markley is going to chime in here shortly about PNI and the development of this quadrant, Penn National Insurance. But this shows the Senate um, around 1995 being ready for demolition, even though there was an effort to try to preserve it at that time. And Mr. Morrison may want to chime in on this. They also included two mantles that came out of the hotel which are now at Historic Harrisburg and were donated uh, to the association by Bill Alexander. Is that correct, Mr. Yep, Morrison? Yep. Would you like to say anything more about that? Well, he, he was uh, the, the previous owner of, of the Senate Hotel and I think of the adjoining buildings as well and, and did a major historic preservation tax credit project in the 1980s uh, to rehab those buildings and uh, upgrade them and move tenants in, uh, and uh, so when the when the building was uh, going to be initially not entirely demolished, but the facade was going to be incorporated into the new uh, Penn National building, uh, he uh, gave uh, or he was given the opportunity to to take out anything from the building. Uh, interior that he wanted, and the two fireplaces he took and put them in storage uh, in a barn in Hummelstown. The barn was sold about a month or two ago, so the, the fireplaces had to be moved very quickly, so they've been brought here, donated to Historic Harrisburg, and we're going to be auctioning them uh, through Cordier's auction house uh, in the very near future. Uh, we, do you want to talk now about the salvaging of, of the uh, the, the other portions of the building, or does that come later? No, why don't we do that, and then uh, Christopher can talk about P&I, but why don't you talk about the salvaging? Well, the, Do you want to come up here to talk about I that? Can, I can certainly do that. Okay. You're not really in the, I'm trying to get the, um, the video anyway, okay. so you're not really seeing it. Okay, all right. Go well, uh, when the P&I project was proposed, uh, Historic Harrisburg really had a mixed uh, view of whether it was good or bad was good from the standpoint that, that a major uh, business, a major corporate presence in the city of Harrisburg would have the opportunity to stay in Harrisburg if they could build a large enough building right here on Market Square. If the negative was the fact that these historic buildings, not only this, but also the older Greenwald building, and even by then, the, um, the, the Yaffe building on the, on the corner, the Durban building, that was, uh, 75 years old and, and historic in many ways. Uh, so we hated to see them go, but uh, when it came down to it, to keep Penn, Penn National in the city, and this was all brokered by Mayor Steve Reed in his office, uh, we, we talked about where could, where could we meet halfway with Penn National. And the halfway was that the hotel really was no longer functioning as a hotel. And, and behind the facade, it, there, there really wasn't much there except the fireplaces. The Senate Hotel, the Senate Horseshoe Bar on the first floor was kind of a CD bar at that point. So really what we were talking about was the facade, the architecture, this very ornate uh, brownstone. You can see portions of it over in the plaza of the Broad Street Market. And also there were probably 50 beautiful stained glass windows, some of these transoms, and some of these bay windows and so forth throughout the building. So the idea was that the, uh, the facade would be incorporated into the new building. Historic Harrisburg had the opportunity to salvage and resell uh, the, uh, 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 the windows. Of course, the, the stone was gonna stay, but then when we found out that the building could not be saved, we said, well, we really would, would don't wanna see that ornate the, some of these beautiful medallion stones here 
going to a landfill. We wanted to see them preserved, so we, we conducted silent auctions for all those pieces and sold most of them, and most of them are now owned by people in, in the Harrisburg area. They have them in their, in their gardens and so forth. And uh, it was better than sending it to a landfill. And unfortunately, the building couldn't be saved. There, there was, as you can see, it was a very narrow building to begin with. It didn't have much depth, but the, 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 um, uh, the engineering that would have been required to, to preserve the facade uh, would have been prohibitively expensive. So, so that was when, when the, uh, the arrangement was changed and the, the, the salvaging of all of the, the usable materials uh, took place. So that, that was what we did. Christopher? Yeah, I was just continuing with that. Are you done? Yeah. Part? Okay. Yeah. So um, we'll get to Christopher in a minute. Great. <laughs> if I may. Sure, if you're in charge. <laughs> I don't know if I'm in charge. I'm just trying one way or the other. So this is Goldsmiths, and we're looking at the buildings which ultimately became the footprint for the PNI Tower. And Christopher Marco will be talking about that. But Goldsmiths was a very famous uh, furniture store downtown um, that was founded um, in the late 1880s. Um, they also shared the space with the Coon Clothing Company originally because they were related, the families were related one way or the other. Over time, Goldsmiths took over this entire building as well as the building next door, um, which you can kind of half see, which was originally Troop Brothers. There were two troops on the square. One was the Troop Music House on the south end of the square, and the other was Troop Brothers, which was also a music house, and they were brothers. I wonder how they got along, but <laughs> in any respect, that was in this building. And they finally went out uh, of business in the mid-1960s, and Goldsmiths took over the entire property at that point. And they were functioning well until probably the, uh, the late 1980s. And at that point um, is when changes were made. So with that said, we go to the PNI Tower. And Christopher Markley is here, and he can talk a bit about it and the development of it and how it came about and why it's so great for Harrisburg. I think I might even get on camera. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. So have you ever noticed that the best stories that human beings tell in the history of humanity and all cultures, they, they share common themes. And people in different eras and different cultures in different times tell these stories and there are a lot of similarities. So the very brief story that I'll share about the Penn National Insurance uh, Headquarters Development Project, you could take me out of this and bring in many other corporate executives and real estate developers who've done projects in the city of Harrisburg, you would hear very common themes, one of which is the incredible importance of historic Harrisburg to have a seat at the table to make sure the projects are done right. So the themes that you usually get in these stories, they start out with a conflict and they require creative problem solving and then collaboration. And if you get that formula right, it's a happy ending story. It's success for everybody. That was our story. So about 25 years ago, uh, the CEO at the time knew we needed to construct a new headquarters building. And we took an option on a property on the West Shore near where Penn Live and the Patriot News has its headquarters now. And since 1919, when our company was founded, we were in the city of Harrisburg. So almost immediately, Mayor Reed got on the phone with our CEO at the time, and, and here's where the first conflict arose. He said, hey, you guys are not leaving the city. And we said, well, we have to. We don't think that there's property available that would meet our needs and that could be redeveloped affordably. He said, no, I'll prove you wrong. So gradually, after looking at several different uh, potential opportunities, we settled on uh, the, the land where the headquarters building is now in Market Square, which was fully built out, including the historic center hotel. So we start with a conflict with the mayor, we begin to collaborate, have some creative problem solving with him, and then we realize, hey, we have to tear down some buildings here. Historic Harrisburg gets involved, looking out for the, the beautiful integrity of the city. So creative problem solving and collaboration led us at first to believe that we could preserve the facade of the Senate Hotel. When that became an engineering uh, impossibility, 
the decision was floated, well, you could essentially cast that facade in fiberglass and it could be stuck onto the building. And that didn't seem to make much sense to create a Disneyland type of a recreation. But through gradual collaboration with the city and historic Harrisburg and my company's executive team, all at the table, we came out with what was a, a, a win for everyone. And I should mention Martin Murray Architects, Murray Associates Architects. So the collaboration resulted in a company that was founded in the city of Harrisburg in 1919 to build its newest headquarters building still in the city rather than in the suburbs. And the collaboration with Murray Associates and with my company's executive team led us to spend, I'm sure, quite a bit more than we would have needed to spend to make sure that the building was designed in a way that took into account the architectural context of the rest of the square. And I promise I'll sit down in one second, but one thing that really impressed me with the design from Murray, Murray Associates, they realized that the square was about a three or four or five story high square for the most part. And when you'd walk along the streets of Market Square, through your peripheral vision, that was the scale of the city that you encountered. And to put up a 15 story building could, could sort of uh, create some, some conflict and pressure in, in style and, and just seem out of place. So they designed an inset, the seventh floor. And if you're walking down the sidewalk and you don't happen to look up to the top, your peripheral vision informs you that our building fits with the context of the rest of the square. So that only came about because of collaboration. And historic Harrisburg made it possible, the city of Harrisburg made it possible for us to stay. And by collaborating as a group, the developer, the, the corporate executives, the historic preservationists, the city's interests, we reached an outcome that I think was very beneficial for all. So you could rattle off names of other businesses that have redeveloped in the city. You've had similar wins, uh, probably more than, than you could rattle off. But So it, it's a great story, and, and we're really grateful for the outcome. And we've been great. M&T, right, right across the square from you guys. It's yeah. a major uh, financial presence. And Harrisburg University. And we'll get, we'll get to some of that later. Thanks, Christopher. So, of course, this building not only increased, helped increase the tax base for the city because of the value of the structure, but also the employment and the employment spin-offs that occur, would occur from the employees that were there. And the other cool thing about the building is the cross-vaulted ceiling, roof, I should say. So many high-rises just have flat roofs, you know, but this building has that cool cross-vaulted roof um, profile and design, which really distinguishes especially when you look at the city skyline. Very well done structure, Mr. Marshall. <laughs> so moving on, we're going to still stay on the north um, west quadrant. Uh, this is pretty much at the site where City Hall is now, but or way back, it was William Calder's office in Liberty Stable. He had a stagecoach coach business um, in the mid 19th century and then later it ended up for bookings on the Pennsylvania Canal and, and other transportation modes at that time, and that's where he went if he wanted to either book uh, on a stagecoach or, or um, on, on a canal passage to the west. Uh, so we wanted to show that as a very early building on the square, and many of the other buildings on the square in the early 19th century looked like this. But it was later demolished, it was pretty much the same site, for the Calder Building, and the Calder Building we had William Calder's stagecoach line, but then we had the Calder building. I'm not quite sure that the names were the same for any reason or if it was a coincidence, but this is the Calder building. And for a period of time in the early 20th century, it served as the mayor's office on the first floor, which I learned recently. And then after that, it was a tobacco um, place, uh, tobacco wholesale uh, facility, and then offices above. The Spot Restaurant, uh, which we may recall, is directly to the left. Um, other buildings that had been to the right of the Goldsmiths building, which would have been here, um, were demolished over, over time uh, for parking and the spot and so forth. And the spot, you can see a, a close-up of it just before it closed. Again, we're looking west. This is Second Street and uh, where P&I is now. And Jeff, now the spot's the first left. location, but it, it moved and, and stayed in business for another couple right. decades. What happened was when City Hall was built, um, the Calder building was demolished. 
and the spot moved, and they moved to the corner of Second and Walnut Streets on the northwest corner for a number of years until I guess Billy Caldice retired um, five or ten years ago, and now it's a different uh, retail establishment. But we wanted to at least document this, and of course that's what that, that's there today. Um, Caller building being here, spot restaurant being essentially here, and then Goldsmith's over. Now Goldsmith's would have been over in here. And what's also cool, which it should be pointed out about the EMI building, is look how part of it was cantilevered over the roof of City Hall, which was an interesting way of creating more space for air rights. And of course, the city went with that at the time. There was no reason not to. And City Hall was built and finished in 1982, so the PNI Tower came later by 15 years. And so City Hall was already in place when PNI was built. But the cantilever of these floors going from you know, sort of the fourth or fifth floor up to the top, coming over a portion of City Hall is a very interesting and unique feature and very creative at the time. Uh, now, moving to the right a little bit is the Union Trust Building, originally the bank, city's first skyscraper, quote unquote. It was the first building to be higher than six stories, and it's eight stories, and also it was built um, steel frame construction with curtain wall, not masonry and wood, but steel frame, curtain wall, um, and it was uh, built in 1906. And this is a 1906 view while it was still under construction and then completed, maybe a 1910 postcard showing it uh, done. And of course, thankfully, we still have it, only 20 feet wide, <laughs> but still a very interesting building architecturally and helps to define the square um, from that standpoint. Now we're going to move over to the north uh, east quadrant of the square. Now this is a cool shot because you can see the entire north east quadrant circa 1915. Uh, Market Street here, the square, which is looking uh, north, Market Street looking east. That's the spire of the old courthouse um, that was built in 1860 and demolished in the mid-1940s in favor of the, the courthouse, of course, that <coughs> exists in front of Market Street. Um, so you can just see some of the buildings um, that were there at that time. This was an earlier structure, later replaced by Kaplan. Uh, which some of you may remember. Um, this is the Bolton Hotel, later the Warner Hotel. Uh, these buildings still uh, remain all up to the time that they were demolished for the Hilton. This was the Rust Building, which was kind of like an office structure, and also there was a hall in there, a, an assembly hall, and that was later demolished in favor of Senate, um, Senate Theater. Now, the Bolton House, was a very old structure. It was only really originally only three stories high. There was a series of townhouses that were joined together. It was originally called the Eagle Hotel. And jo uh, Charles Dickens stayed in that earlier structure, still the same building, but not enlarged, when he was in Harrisburg and America in 1842, writing notes on America, and stayed at what well, at that time was the, the um, Eagle Hotel. Around about the, in the 1860s, a guy by the name of Bolton bought it and added um, the top two floors and this mansard roof, very nicely executed, which is really the hotel that we may remember before it was demolished. Was it that hotel that had a big cafeteria restaurant in? It seemed to me it was called the Delphic's Cafeteria, back in the 50s. I remember there was a cafeteria in the ground floor of the Payne Shoemaker building. Oh, okay. That was the Park Cafeteria. Uh, there may have been, okay. I don't know. Um, if there was, I wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very popular hotel during its existence, um, but obviously went by the wayside. And what happened when the Hilton was built is it was demolished and it was demolished for valet parking. And that valet parking sat there for about 10, 11, 12 years as a vacant lot. It was terrible. People driving into Arrowbury, here was a vacant lot right on the square. Um, but, but then thankfully, uh, Market Square Plaza uh, 
came into existence, which exists under construction, same site as the Werner, which had already been demolished. The developers here did not demolish the, the Werner. Um, it was demolished um, in, because of LA parking for the, uh, for the uh, Hilton. At the time, that had to happen in order to jumpstart the Hilton and get it going from a parking standpoint. This is a shot showing it under construction uh, around 2002. And, oops. and then, my car forgot to get the pointer on this. And then here it is under construction. And we all know it, we've seen it. It's a high rise on the square. Uh, half of it is parking, and then the upper floors are offices. And the Hilton, of course, has the second floor because they were able to expand into the second floor of Market Square Plaza for more convention space, meeting space, another creative way of maximizing Go back footage. one. Yeah. Just for a moment, go back one picture. That's the ballroom level of the Hilton. Right. It right. communicates with the ballroom level of the exactly. main Hilton. That's right. And as many of you may know, the uh, Strawberry Arcade that runs down the alley in the Strawberry Square, and it was extended to join with the Hilton to this facility, to the second floor of Market Square Plaza. So when you're in the Hilton and you're going to a luncheon or a ballroom, you don't realize you're in a different building, <laughs> which is really cool from that standpoint. But again, this shows it under construction, and this shows it well under construction. I had to include this construction elevator, uh, which you can see. I rode in that elevator up to the top. <laughs> I took this photograph, and I will tell you, I will never, ever, ever again <laughs> <laughs> At least not on a 16 or 17 story building. Um, ride up the outside of the building in a construction elevator. I mean, I was freaked out. And these guys are fine, and now they're going to work every day with their hard hats. You know? So, in any respect, I had to include that. Um, uh, being in the thing, there are two of the guys there. So now we want to take another shot of the north um, east quadrant, now showing Kaplan replacing that earlier building, which is well known for, as a record, um, for its record and, and other uh, novelties, as it were. Uh, Harrisburg Hardware was here for a while on the square before it moved up to Second and Pine, um, where it was until it became a um, nightclub or whatever is in there now, at Second and Pine. But that was Harrisburg Hardware on the southwest corner. And then the Patriot News um, was located on the square for years. And you can see Miller's Furniture also, Patriot News here. And two shots showing Patriot News, this is probably taken in the late 1930s. I'm trying to find where this pointer is on here. And that might help some. No, maybe not. And then another shot of the Patriot News on the left, uh, having the scoreboard for the World Series uh, outside, sort of like a congregate around and see what the scores were before the TV, you know, and of course there was radio, but it was a cool thing to do and really added to the drama of the activity on Market Square at the time. Uh, just another shot of the Kaplan's building, which of course was demolished um, in addition to the other structures in favor of the Hilton. And this is looking uh, east on Market Street, down Market Street, you can see the Kumpel building, still in existence, and other buildings on the left here, which is now the Reuters Center. And I included this shot, it's kind of a curious one, probably taken in the 40s, showing early traffic lights on the square, and also a siren was in the process of being installed. Now, was it a siren because of World War II? Was it an air raid? Not air raid necessarily, that came later, but a siren related to civil defense. Don't know. Uh, there was really no um, uh, um, notation on, on the photograph what, what it meant, but we wanted to include it just because it was an interesting photograph. And you can still see the building on, the, um, uh, on that section of the quadrant. And we can't forget the Senate Theater, of course, uh, which is at the very left end, and you may have seen some of the earlier shots of the North um, uh, East Quadrant. Uh, opened in 1938, replaced that earlier rush building that we saw in an earlier slide, and just wanted to show two views of it. And of course it was, uh, 
demolished along with the other buildings for the hill. And I was able to get on the roof of the, uh, what's now the Dolph County Administration Building, but it was Commonwealth Bank, I think, at the time, or Mellon Bank, which is uh, a shot showing the Northwest Quadrant. And this is much later, this is February 1983. And, um, and then for comparison purposes, I wanted to do a before and after. Uh, same view, same angle, got on the roof again of the building, they allowed me up there <laughs> somehow, some way, and shot it, and then went, wanted to shoot the entire view um, as it stands today, both with the Hilton and with Marcus Square Plaza. Sorry. Are you still alive? Mm -hmm. right. We're still alive. Now we're going to go to the Southeast Quadrant. This is a very, very early shot, and there's a balloon in it. I dated it mid-1860s, because um, I think that's when it may have occurred. That could have been a reconnaissance balloon during the Civil War, um, or it could have been for other purposes. But it is so early. You can see the cow on Branch Hall, which is way down at 3rd and Market. We have no photographs of Branch, Branch Hall anywhere, to my knowledge, but that was a major uh, hall for special events and uh, uh, places where people congregated for lectures and other things. Again, the spire of the uh, courthouse, which was built in 1860. Earlier buildings were the Kaplan building, would later be built, and this was, at that time, the Jones House. And this is the roof of one of the markets still being on the square. Uh, the Jones House was built in 1858. And it was where Abraham Lincoln was supposed to stay um, when he came to Harrisburg in 1860 in route to his inauguration. And uh, in fact, you and Mrs. Lincoln may have checked in before Abraham Lincoln went to the state capitol to address make his address. But then, of course, there was a, an assassination plot, and he had to get out of town. And he got out of town by Jacob, Jacob Compton, which took him out of town. So he didn't stay there but he almost stayed there. The earlier building that was there before the Jones House was built was the Washington House. And the reason why it's called the Washington House is that George Washington, en route to the Whiskey Rebellion in 1794, came through Harrisburg. This is reasonably well documented. And he stayed at the Washington House. So you have two presidents George Washington staying on the site, not in the building, but on the site, and then Abraham Lincoln almost staying in this building. So it's kind of cool from that standpoint. When was that building demolished? Um, oh, you're getting to it? There. Okay. So the Jones House, this is another shot, um, looking across the market houses, and the Jones House later became the Leland Hotel uh, in the 1880s. But, but you can see it's only so much in terms of its development. Later, it became expanded as the Commonwealth Hotel. And you can see this pretty much was the edge of the Jones House in the Leland, and then this was added on by James Rupp, who was the same guy that built the Senate Hotel. And what happened here was that Dolph Deposit Bank wanted this building. And in 1903, they bought it and James Russ was out. And he went across and a couple years later and built the Senate. And it was converted to an office building, even though I thought, until I did more research, it remained the Commonwealth Hotel uh, until 1921, which we'll see in a minute what happened. <laughs> but, it, but it was converted to offices by Dolphin Deposit Bank. They wanted to control of this site. And uh, even though the architecture pretty much remained the same, they didn't screw with it from the outside, but it was converted after 1903 to office. 1921 catches on fire, okay? I'm sure Dave House here, when he speaks, will <laughs> be talking about this. And it was still known as the Dauphin Bill um, when Dauphin Deposit Bank acquired it. So caught on fire, wasn't destroyed, but was substantially rebuilt as, as the Dauphin building after, in the 1920s, after the 1921 fire. And this is the building that we may remember until 
Dolph Deposit Bank later ran the King Bank, demolished it for its tower in 1989, which we will get to as such. <laughs> so he and I, Hilton, Market Square Plaza, M&T Tower, originally the Dolphin Deposit Tower, had skyscraper, as it were, height to Market Square as the center of not just Harrisburg, but as I look at it, the metropolitan area. Financial district. <laughs> Moving in uh, along on the um, south um, eastern quadrant, here we had the Dolphin Building, and this is a little bit later, um, 1946. No longer the Commonwealth Hotel or the Dolphin Building as the earlier Commonwealth Hotel, but it's now the post And you can see there are other structures here, which includes Joe the Motorist Friend. And Joe the Motorist Friend went back into the 1940s, and I remember that they were there well into the 70s, if not later than that, uh, at that site in those buildings. Dolphin Deposit finally took over all those buildings um, and integrated them with either new facades or new construction into their complex. And we want to talk about proof. Um, whoops. That should be OU proof. I thought I made that correction, but it didn't. <laughs> it didn't pan out on this particular slide. This building was built um, in 1893, and it was called the Dolphin Building when it was built. It was an office building. It was, it was termed as the, the Original, the first office building in Harrisburg as an office building. And then Krupp took it over in 1905 as the Krupp Music House. Uh, in fact, the word Krupp is still up here. And there was a deal between Krupp and the Dauphin, but they, they said, no, we want our building to be the Dauphin building. This isn't the Dauphin building anymore. So they had a deal where he transferred the name of Dauphin building to the corner property which was the Dolphin Building we just looked at. And this then became the Krupp Building with the name Krupp chiseled up there and over here too. I thought I made that correct, so maybe I didn't save that slide properly. <laughs> now moving beyond Krupp is what's more recently been known as the Menneker Building, but it was originally the Johnson Building, the Johnson Paper Company, Johnson, S-T-O-N. Uh, paper company built this building in um, 1906 and it was originally a four-story building and in 1912 um, two additional stories were added to it which we'll see but the Johnson paper company had it and you can see an early rendering of it after the two stories were built in 1912 as you can see and if you look at the earlier only you know one, two, three, four stories. So even though it also was a steel frame building, built in 1906, it wasn't higher than eight stories. So the USS and G building or the Union Trust building still had the distinction of being the first skyscraper in Harrisburg. I'm sorry. 